So thanks everyone for being here today. I'm Bailing Shaw and I'm Dean of the College of Communications at Cal State Fullerton. This year, it's also my pleasure to chair the Journalism Education Committee for the Society of Professional Journalists. And I'm really excited to be hosting our second webinar of this summer. The title of this webinar is To Be or Not To Be Accredited, How ACEJMC Accreditation Can Help or Hurt Your Journalism Program. Today, we're going to learn about ACEJMC, ACEJMC's recently updated eight standards of accountability. We're also going to hear why some programs choose to get accredited and why others don't. And hopefully the audience will gain some insights into what questions programs should ask themselves as they consider whether ACEJMC accreditation is right for you. So as you already know, this uh, seminar is being recorded so that SPJ folks can access it afterwards and learn um, for the folks who weren't able to join us live today. And I'm going to now introduce our panelists and then we'll just get started. So our first panelist that I'd like to introduce is Ms. Patricia Thompson, who is the Executive Director of the Accrediting Council for Education in Journalism and Math Communications. The ACEJMC is currently housed in the Philip Merrill College of Journalism at the University of Maryland. So hi, Patricia. Hello. We also have with us Dr. Michelle Haig, who is Professor of Public Relations in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Texas State University, and she is an ACEJMC member representing the Broadcast Education Association. Last, we have Dr. Jane Stewart, who is the department head and Alfred Delahaye Endowed Professor in Mass Communication at Nickel State University, located in Thibodeau, Louisiana. He is an ACE JMC member representing the small programs who are members of the Association of Schools of Journalism and Mass Communication. I should also mention that I'm also on the council and I currently represent on the council, the Association for Education and Journalism and Mass Communication. It's basically like we only have six words to use and then we rearrange them in different orders. So what we're going to do today is review the standards for program accreditation. I do want to emphasize that what the ACEJMC accredits is not individuals, it's not people, it's academic programs or academic units. And then we'll move into a question round for panelists and then we'll open it up for audience Q&A. So to begin, um, I'm going to post to the chat the current eight standards for accreditation. And so for the folks who um, want to look that up for yourself, because I know we're all journalists who like to double check our information, you can do that. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and get started with Pat. If you could just offer us one or two key tips for each of the following standards. Standard one, which is mission, governance and administration. Standard seven, which is resources, facilities and equipment. And standard four, which is diversity and inclusiveness. So Pat, take it away. Thank you, Bayling, and hello everyone. Um, just a, a, a little bit of um, background. Every 10 years, ACEJMC undergoes a major revision of its standards. Um, I mean, just think about the changes in higher education and the media industry over the past 10 years. We, of course, make minor changes from time to time, but at least once every 10 years, we step back and we make a major overhaul to modernize our policies and our standards. Um, we start by creating a standards review committee. Uh, there were eight people on it. Uh, it's a process that stretches over a two or three year period and it includes surveys, we meet with constituent groups to get input, and then the council members um, approve a draft and then the final standards. So I just wanted to start out by saying this because this past academic year was the first one where we used the new standards, the current standards that we'll be talking about today. Um, so as Bailing said, she's asked each of us you know, just to talk a little bit about um, several of the standards. I'm gonna start with uh, standard one, which is mission governance and administration. Um, we call that our, our leadership standard. Um, the, the highlights and tips uh, that, that I would um, stress for standard one is that it's important that um, an accredited unit have a written mission statement and a written strategic plan. Um, and the strategic plan must include uh, measurable actions. You must show um, what, what you are trying to accomplish and what you've done. And the, uh, the, the, the mission statement and the strategic plan must be made public. They, they should be posted in, uh, 
in a, a public spot on your website. Um, the site team that comes to review your campus for standard one, they'll be examining the um, effectiveness of your unit leadership. Um, and they will do this by um, talking to your faculty, your students, your alumni, the employers who hire your students as interns and for jobs, and the um, heads of uh, other departments on your campus. So for example, um, one of the meetings that will take place when the site team is there, they will, um, it might include the, the history department chair or the English department chair, um, the, the dean of your honors college, the, the person who heads the admissions office in, at your university, uh, people who um, regularly interact with your students because they'll want to get uh, some feedback about the effectiveness of the leadership team. They also will uh, examine your policies and procedures. They'll, they'll uh, look at areas like faculty governance. They'll, they'll look at your faculty meeting minutes. They'll make sure that you have good, a good process in place to select and evaluate your administrators and a good process for um, addressing uh, complaints and concerns. Um, I'm gonna go next to standard four, which is diversity and inclusiveness. Um, that's an area that uh, is certainly getting a lot of attention these days. Uh, and standard four is one of the standards that we made major revisions to this year. I would say the most important um, thing to know about standard four is that ACEJMC is most concerned about student outcomes. Um, we are, we are um, looking to, to get uh, the answer to the question, is this a program that is graduating students who are prepared to succeed in our multicultural workplaces? That's kind of the, the foundation of what we are looking for. Your students should be able to talk about what they're learning. Your faculty should be able to talk about how they're teaching in this area. Um, there also will be questions about whether your, your climate is inclusive. Um, they will be asking your students and faculty and staff um, many schools do things like climate surveys to um, try to uh, get information about what, what areas they need to improve. There also will be questions about how is your school helping all its faculty, not just its faculty of color, but all its faculty teach in ways that develop culturally proficient communicators. Those are all really important parts of the newly revised standard four. Um, and yes, uh, I, I'm gonna say there is language in the standard that says the standard will be applied in compliance with federal and state laws and regulations. Um, that's actually been part, part of the standard for many years. Um, we certainly are aware, I mean, it's, it's, di it's difficult to even keep up with all the developments and changes that are taking place uh, these days in the DEI area. Uh, we certainly are aware that in the future, there may be some information or charts that we may need to you know, adjust um, some of the things that we require um, and we will, we will have to adapt. The council is also talking about um, gathering and sharing some best practices in this, in this area to help schools improve. Um, I should also mention that we, we were one of the um, first accrediting bodies in the nation to have a diversity standard. We've had a diversity standard since the late 1980s. It of course has been revised many times over the years. Um, but the bottom line for us with standard four is that we're looking for, for you to tell your story about what you're doing in DEI areas, what obstacles you're encountering, what progress you've made, you know, tell us what you are, what you are doing in this area. Um, and then I'm just going to speak very briefly, um, the standard seven, which is resources, facilities, and equipment. This is one of the standards that has not changed very much in recent years. Um, there, there's some basic uh, questions that are asked in terms of determining if the school has adequate resources to fulfill its mission. Um, and, and also, how do your resources compare with the resources given to similar departments on your campus. So in other words, are you getting your fair share um, of the university's money and resources? The site teams will also ask faculty, staff, and students um, if, they if they feel they have adequate equipment and support to do their jobs. 
and to meet the unit's learning curriculum and research goals. So I, I'll just finish by just saying it's important to stress um, for this standard that we certainly do not expect small programs to have the same resources as programs at large universities. We, we accredit small schools, medium-sized schools, large schools. We, we currently accredit 119 programs. Just an example of the range of the schools we accredit. I'm spending a lot of my time this summer working on site team assignments for the schools with uh, visits that actually start in October this year. One of the schools I'm working with, um, they're coming up for reaccreditation. They have only six full-time faculty and they have 158 students. The other side of the range, um, last year we accredited the Newhouse School at Syracuse, uh, which has more than 2000 students, more than a dozen degree specializations and more than 80 full-time faculty. Um, I think our site teams in the council really do an excellent job you know, applying this standard appropriately. So I'll just end on that note and turn it back over to Bailing. Great. Thanks so much, Pat. So next, I'm going to ask Michelle to talk about three other standards. Standard two, which is curriculum and instruction. Standard three, which is assessment, um, a perennial favorite. And then standard five, which is faculty. And I'll also drop those into the chat. Go ahead, Michelle. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to start uh, briefly talking about curriculum and instruction. and. My experience that I used is I've been on more than a dozen, I don't even know how many site team visits. Um, and usually, you know, the curriculum instruction, I think one of the biggest reasons some programs no longer get accredited or think they don't want to be accredited is because of the 72 credit rule. But actually, this, I mean, that was always a reason I several people say, oh, we don't want to be accredited because we don't want to abide by that rule. But with the new revised standards that went to in, into effect, um, we no longer have the 72 credit rule. Um, the 72 credit rule actually just talked about students needing to take 72 credits outside the unit. Um, and now, um, it, you know, that we still encourage them to, to um, have a broader liberal arts and science education just because we need them to be informed communicators, um, but we no longer look mandate at 72 credits. Um, the other key takeaway for curriculum and instruction is keep it simple. Um, you know, I've been, I've been on the team to Syracuse and I've been on a team where there was only four faculty members, you know, so I've, I've been on teams to see a, a wide variety of programs. But one thing I can tell you about curriculum is sometimes people make it too complicated. And it's usually smaller programs that might make it too complicated. Um, and I think one of the, you can, it's hard to explain the curriculum in the self-study. It's hard for the site team to see the curriculum then when they're writing the site team report. And one way to know if your curriculum is too, um, cumbersome would be to look at the prereqs. You know, like I've seen programs that have X number of prereqs for every for every course, which is sort of cumbersome for students to manage. Um, it also looks like curriculum bloat. Um, how many classes do you have or are you offering? Um, and I say that especially for smaller programs because sometimes there's just tons and tons of classes when the, some of the material could be folded into others. Um, and I think one of the reasons we under we can see the curriculum be too uh, cumbersome is it comes out in the student meetings because we spend a lot of time talking to students and students will complain about well I can't get done with the program because I don't I I started later I didn't get into the major and I don't have these prereqs and they're only offered X number of you know every once a year or blah 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 um, and that happens a lot with smaller programs so sometimes it's you know one of the one of the ways you can do that is by offering a variety of, you know, prereqs like, oh, you have to have one of the three, right? Or something like that. So I think one of the benefits of having your program accredited is it does take, you know, it, you get an external view of your curriculum and to see where some of that bloat might be happening or why is it so complicated? You know, like, why is, why is it so complicated? Because for the most part, um, you know, we, we know that you're going to be updating it to prepare them for the visual world that they're, they're navigating and they're learning all the video skills and the storytelling skills. Um, so it's just a matter of making the curriculum and, uh, you know, um, 
be present uh, and easy to navigate for the students. But I think one of the issues that a lot of programs, one of the main reasons programs aren't accredited is because of that 72 credit rule that no longer exists. And I say that because I did a session at BEA um, in April, and that came up quite a bit that a number of the people at the session didn't realize that we had no longer had the 72 credit rule. And now I'll spend most of my time on assessment just because I tend to write the assessment standard and assessment is one of the areas people tend to be found non-compliant um, the most, most often. So if I were to give you some tips on assessment, you know, I would, I would argue some people think that they don't want to be, you know, I understand that every unit's putting together assessment plans for regional accrediting bodies because, you know, everybody's being regionally accredited. But I think one of the, the, the most important things is you don't need a lot. I, I don't know. I, I, I just say this because so many people get it to make assessment way too complicated. So, you know, in the AC, JMC says it, it asks us to look, do they have indirect and direct indicators. It does not say you need 10 direct indicators and 10 indirect indicators. It just asks you, do you have direct or indirect indicators? So, um, you know, one of the most, one of the best things, one of the reasons you do assessment is to close the loop. You know, you wanna make sure that your kids are prepared to enter industry. So one of the benefits of being an accredited program is we mandate that um, some type of working professionals be that your alumni group or other community contacts be involved with the assessment process and they should be constantly reviewing you know student work and giving feedback so then you can update your curriculum but you know that's one of the most common reasons people um, fail on the assessment standard is because they're not including industry professionals um, and one thing to note there is that you know, it's one, you're making it too complicated because you have too many direct or indirect measures. Two, you might not be including these um, external industry folks, which one, like I went to a school that had every student was mandated to take an internship and they didn't use any of the internship evaluations in their assessment report which right there would have been um, feedback from industry people, right? And so um, I'm like, okay, you don't use industry people, but here you have these file cabinets full of assessment uh, internship evaluations that could have filled, filled that um, need. Um, one of the other things I think that is one of the benefits of being an accredited program is we've been told multiple times that when I learned this, you know, what as a, as an assistant professor at Penn State is when Penn State, when assessments started becoming more and more important at the university level, we were already well ahead of that because we had always been accredited. And so usually our standards as for, a, you know, to pass the assessment standard for AC, JMC tend to be a little bit tighter than passing them for SACs or middle states or something like that. So a lot of times, you know, um, journalism mass comm programs are used as like the gold star um, as universities looked um, for to, to up their assessment game at the university level. But I can also tell you that um, a lot of people think it's way too complicated because you have to have this report for the university that goes on to their credit, you know, their regional accrediting bodies, and then you have to have something for us. But a lot of times the university level people will work with the unit and use one plan. Um, I, you know, Penn State worked with us to use one plan, Texas State works with us to use one plan. So that's always um, a positive is, it, you know, but I think one of the other key takeaways in assessment is, you know, there's always a rubric. Um, I use a rubric for my for assessment that is based on the AC JMC competencies. And a lot of times people might make a rubric, but they don't exact, it's hard to see which competency is tied to which part, which question on the rubric. So um, there was an article in Journalism Mass Comm Educator a number of years ago where uh, Mickey from Iowa State sort of laid it all out and he gave you a plan. Um, and actually his rubric, um, for assessment was the same one he sort of tied to his internship evaluations as well. You know, so you can use the same rubric um, across different different things you're assessing. Um, the other thing I think is thing that I think is important is some people will assess 
everything every semester and that gets to be too much because how are you actually going to take the feedback and update your course, right? So if you pick one course in the fall and a different course in the spring, and then you know, then you can, then you can update it. Um, you know, there's a. I went to a, a program this year on an, a site team, and they they had it down. They did not evaluate every single course every single semester. They only evaluated certain competencies each year. So it was really less of a burden on a very small faculty. If um, and they they made it a less less complicated than even here at Texas State. It was it was really well done. Um, and so those are sort of the the takeaways I give you. Um, but one of the, the biggest takeaway I think is to keep it simple because I cannot tell you how many assessment plans I've seen that are way too complicated because they think we expect all this stuff and we don't expect all that stuff. We just want to make sure you're um, using the feedback to close the loop to prepare the students to work in, in industry. Um, and that, that's a way to up, make sure your curriculum is updated. Um, and as long as you're, you know, uh, yeah, in, um, nobody's going to say, oh, you didn't, you didn't assess this class this semester. All we care is that maybe you assessed it sometime and you were able to, to improve the curriculum. That's the big takeaway. Um, some people have so much assessment data, they don't have time to figure out how to tie that back in to update the curriculum then because it's just overwhelming. And then finally, the last, um, the last uh, one I'll talk about is faculty. And this used to be two different two different standards, but now it's combined into one for faculty. Um, one thing, you know, I think is the most important thing to remember about ACJMC is that you're not competing against an R1 school. You're not competing against, nobody's competing against anybody. Um, the site team is gonna show up and look at, are you doing what you say you're doing in your self-study report? So I bring that up in, the, in this section, the faculty section, because I've been to places where they've got five faculty and I've been to, I went to Syracuse and I, I can't remember how many, that was a lot of faculty. <laughs> and so, I, I mean, I've, I've seen, yeah, you know, I've, I've seen it all. So the most important thing is I did go on a site team visit where every time we asked somebody, they couldn't tell us how many faculty were actually in the unit. So that does prove a problem. Not, not to know how many faculty, full-time faculty people you have. And part of it was as they were other places on campus, but part of it was they didn't, they didn't know. They had it a different number every time in the self-study. So number one is understand who, you know, count your people and know how many people are in your unit. Um, you know, we, we appreciate a mix of PhDs and non-PhDs. You know, it's not, it, it, we just want a blend of good people. Um, the most important thing is that the, the faculty should be um, engaged in serving the students, right? And that's, that's the most important thing they should be doing. Um, you know, we do assess the research, creative, research and creative activity faculty are producing, but what that we don't expect a small program to compete with a heavy teaching load to compete with an R1 that has 70 faculty. Once again, that's unique to, you, to what you're doing too. And I can tell you, I've been to a number of small programs where, who have, are teaching four, four loads and their scholarly output and creative activity is, is extremely impressive. Um, for the other demands they have, the, uh, the teaching and service demands they have. Um, so once it, that's probably the biggest takeaway is, you know, you're not competing against anybody, you're just competing against yourself for lack of better way to word that. Um, and we just wanna make sure that your faculty are, um, are engaged with the students and that your faculty have updated technology skills, um, which is always, you know, we can't always rely on the professors of practice or those new adjuncts to come in and, you know, we, we want to make sure the full time faculty have updated their technology and industry skills, as well as, you know, a lot of times, like Pat was talking about in the DEI initiative, we want people, you know, faculty be, to be trained and look at, you know, a lot of the self studies will talk about the training these faculty have been through to, to incorporate some of that into the classroom. And a lot of times, the self studies will talk about how faculty have attended all these online trainings to be better online teachers. That's all really good, but we also want faculty to be updated on their own skills. Like, so I need to go learn my Adobe Creative Suite. I need to be able to, you know, 
use the be up to date on the technology since I'm I'm teaching it to students. Um, so that would be my uh, what I tell tell you about the faculty standard. Okay. Thanks so much, Michelle. So let's turn it over to James to talk about the remaining two standards, standard six, which is student services, and then standard eight, which is professional and public service. And um, for the audience, if you want to start asking your questions in the Q&A, that would be great. Um, when James is done, I've got some questions for the panelists, and then we'll go to audience questions. So James, take it away. So with regard to um, professional, um, um, and public service, um, I think as a communication program, one of the things that site teams will look at is, are you using those skills in the betterment of, of, of your community? So for example, scholastic journalism activities, um, uh, you know, we expect university faculty to be doing the, the, the standard committee work that we would, you know, if we were in math or English, we would be doing it, but we want to see the application of our skills uh, in terms of uh, public uh, service there. And then, you know, certainly where appropriate, um, staying involved in, uh, as, as uh, uh, Michael, uh, Michelle was saying earlier, um, keeping your own skills current, doing things um, um, in those, those, those lines. Student services, um, Obviously, a big emphasis there is going to be on student media on your campus and the support for that, training, interaction, things of that nature. Uh, and then um, organizations that you have within your, your unit, for example, SPJ or, or the various um, professional organizations, do your students have access to that and do the faculty work closely with that? So that pretty much sums that up. Okay, thank you for being so succinct. So let me start a question round um, to all the panelists. So what are some key reasons for programs to seek accreditation if it's their first time or to maintain their program accreditation from AC, JMC if they've already been accredited? So this can be reasons you've seen from your own program or reasons from units that you've visited as a site team member or what have you. What are reasons, what are the pros? Why do we want to do this? I think one of the major reasons is, you know, a, it helps you fight for more resources or other things. Um, you know, uh, it also gives us a step up. I know here at Texas State, they they would like other units to be accredited, if that makes sense. But so, um, but I mean, if Judy needs something a lot, she's like, I use that sort of, you know, that probably she always says they're probably tired of me saying, but it's we're, we're accredited. You know, this is an expectation that the kids have the have up, updated camera equipment or at least enough to check out, right? Mm -hmm. Or um, so there's there's things like that. But I think at, from a faculty member perspective, um, you know, I can't imagine having 50 kids in a PR writing course. You know, so at least if it's accredited, I've only got 20, so I can give them give them feedback. Um, because I can I can have them writing two to three times a week versus if I have 50 kids in you know a PR writing course at an unaccredited program, you're you're going to cut way back on the, on the writing experiences and the feedback because you've got too many students in a class. Yeah, and so for the folks on here who are just completely new, um, ACEJMC does require that skills based courses be capped at 20 students. Um, so if you've got a 21 first student that needs to take that class, you've got to open up another section um, or be prepared to answer questions. Um, another example of a resource related item is the expectation is that the majority of classes that are offered are taught by tenure line faculty, not adjunct faculty. Um, James and Patricia, what other what other pros are there? Why do we want people to do this? I why should think, people want to do it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and once again, I think Nichols is a school like maybe some of the others on this call where um, the, university wide there's a strong commitment to um, accreditation. As I remember, on our campus, every unit for which there is a national accreditation has it. Mm -hmm. um, but what that does for us here is it increases our credibility uh, and offers some validation when we go to the administration and say we need X or Y, a faculty line or a piece of equipment. And then because we are going through this periodic external review by our peers across the nation, 
and if we can maintain our accreditation, then the administration says, okay, you must be doing something correctly. Um, and also, I would say uh, it keeps us focused on task. You know, if in doing the day-to-day -day job, sometimes you get uh, so bogged down in what's ahead of you that you might lose sight of the bigger picture. Well, when you're accredited, you know that you're going to have to do this self-study periodically. And so you're keeping data and you're thinking about things. So to use the, the advertising term, it's top of mind, you know, this, this broader perspective on, on what you're doing. And likewise, that periodic review is important to prevent stagnation and getting uh, that outside um, uh, feedback, somebody coming in and, and not from, I don't want to pick on SACS, we're, we're SACS accredited school, but I would like someone who, who's from a program that's doing basically what I'm doing to give me some feedback, not someone from an academic discipline that doesn't even know what our mission is. So I would say that would be the three, the, the three arguments in favor of accreditation. Great. And Pat, what would you add? I just had a, a couple of things to, to add. I agree with, um, Michelle and, and uh, James had some great comments. Um, so we, do, our office, we do get calls from students and parents asking if a school is accredited, you know, when they're doing their searches, you know, it is important to people. They, they will ask, they will contact us and say, I'm thinking about going to the X, Y, and Z school. I can't find out from this website if it's accredited or not. So I'd like to know about that. So, um, you know, this, so it's an, it's an assurance of, of quality um, for students, parents, employers and the public. Um, and I would, I would um, also add that that's some of the comments um, about the, the 20 to one skills ratio. Um, that's, that's for some schools I know that is one of the reasons they, they aren't yet seeking accreditation. They don't have the money to, you know, to hire the extra faculty to do that. But that's, that's a very important principle for us. Um, so I, and I, and uh, we, we, Many, many of our school directors tell us that going through that self-study process, they learn so much about themselves. Yeah, it's time consuming. And um, I'm sure there are times where you're thinking to yourself, why are they asking me this question? Um, but it's, it's a good process to go through. And the end result, you, you learn a lot about yourself. Plus, as, as James mentioned, you're getting people coming to your campus who um, you can learn from. They learn from you, you learn from them. So I would like to offer two things from the perspective of um, an administrator. Um, so there's a question in the chat about film programs and we'll get to that in the audience Q&A. My college of communications has four departments. One is the accredited unit, which is communications, but that includes concentrations in advertising, journalism, public relations and entertainment and tourism communications. There's a separate department of cinema and television and film. Um, so that's you know, something to talk about. I think from an administrative standpoint, here are two reasons to get accreditation is number one, enrollment drops, right? National demographic trends are such that all universities pretty much are facing enrollment cliffs. And it's a competitive advantage for your journalism and mass comm program to be able to say, we are one of 119 accredited programs in the world, right? It's not just in the country, we have programs accredited in other countries. It's, we are one of 119 programs that are accredited in the world. Um, so it's a competitive advantage. And those of us who are accredited are not threatened by having a 120th program or a 121st program. Like, please come join this club and help yourself recruit students. Um, parents like the external third-party validation of having a, an, an accredited program. Uh, the other thing that I'll say to that is, you know, the higher education context right now is that there are some um, purported threats to academic freedom and uh, seeming threats to traditional academic concepts like tenure, right? So when you have an accreditation requirement that upwards of 50% of the classes you offer must be taught by tenure line faculty, that's a defense, right? against efforts to reduce the number of faculty who are on tenure track. Um, some of the other things that I'm hearing from some other deans around the country is that in some difficult conversations on certain campuses about diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, our diversity and inclusiveness standard, standard four, has been cited as a reason why that those concepts should remain in the curriculum. 
Um, and obviously, as Pat said at the beginning of the seminar or at the beginning of this webinar, this is a very fast changing legal landscape. And so we do everything in compliance with federal and state laws. Um, but these are just some of the challenges and some of the administrative perspectives that um, I've experienced and that I'm also hearing from some other administrators across the country. Okay, so let me go to the second question. So we've talked about all the reasons why we should encourage programs to pursue ACEJM accreditation. So I'm wondering uh, to the panelists, what are some key reasons that y'all have heard for programs to not seek accreditation um, or to let their accreditation lapse? And maybe Pat, you could start that off by just telling us how much does it cost a unit to participate in accreditation processes? Um, so I uh, can't give you an exact <laughs> number because you know it varies so much, but um, what I did do was I, I just kind of put together, there, there are basically three levels of cost, um, and all this information, by the way, is on our, our website, acejmc.org. Um, the first level is what I, what I would call pre-visit expenses, so that if, if you're a school that has never been accredited and you're seeking it for the first time, we will send usually one or two people to your campus for a couple of days, um, and you pay their expenses. Um, the, the purpose of, of that pre-visit is uh, it will result in a report that says, okay, this is what you need to do in order to be ready for a review. These are our standards. This is how it, it appears you're, um, you're prepared or not prepared on a certain standard. And I will tell you, we have many schools that, that take this step and they, they, never, they never finish. They, they, they either decide they don't have the money, they don't have the time, or um, they they just realize that they uh, this is not something that, that it's something that that's going to take a lot longer than maybe they expected. We've had schools that have had their pre visit um, and have come up again in ten years, saying, "Okay, now we're ready." Um, so you pay those expenses. It's usually not very much, and if you get to the point where you are are ready to be put on the schedule for your first visit, you pay a one thousand um, dollar application fee. Um, once you're accredited, your annual dues are $2,000 a year. Um, we have actually one of the more reasonable uh, uh, dues uh, structures compared to other accrediting bodies. So it's $2,000 a year in annual dues and annual dues do provide most of our operating budget. And then the third one, which is more complex is um, you do pay uh, for, for site team expenses. Once you are accredited, you come up for reaccreditation six years later. We have a six year cycle. So once every six years, you're paying for a site team to come to your campus and review your program. They're on campus from Sunday afternoon through Wednesday morning. Um, the size of the site team depends on the, the, uh, the size of your school, how many faculty you have, how many different sequence specialties you have. Um, and then you, um, and of course, you know, hotels in New York City are going to be more than, than hotels in some small college town in, in Nebraska. Um, the, uh, the school pays for the site team chair, just the chair, not the entire team, to present the, the team report at the um, ACEJC committee meeting, which is usually in March in Chicago. And we very much encourage all unit directors to attend the committee and council meetings themselves. It's not mandatory. I can't imagine someone not going and everybody I've talked to who has ever been has been glad they've been there because if the site team chair um, or the committee chair cannot answer a question that council or committee members might have, they call on you to answer the question from the audience. So that's kind of a just a quick summary of the cost. As I mentioned, we've got more information available. And if someone has other questions, I'm, you just reach out to me and I'm happy to try to give you maybe some figures that might relate more to your specific region of the country. Great. So what other reasons have we heard about programs not pursuing accreditation? Well, I would say there are two factors um, or two challenges, and, and I think they're worth, uh, the reward is worth the challenge, but, uh, and Pat was just talking about the expense, well, to put that in perspective, you know, we pay uh, was Pat, just correct me if I'm wrong, but 2000 a year. Yep. But when we come up for accreditation, so we'll be writing our self study this year for next year. Well, I'm going to be at that committee meeting. So that's travel that that now that's not that's not a requirement. It's just 
I've found over the years it's good practice. So that's an, a travel expense I have this year that I wouldn't necessarily incur otherwise. And then as she said, there are expenses in the site team year. Uh, and at a program where we have not actually had a departmental travel budget since the previous gubernatorial um, uh, the group that was in there, uh, we, we raise our own travel money or we have to depend on the dean. So, you know, a thousand dollars for me to go to Chicago for a day is a lot of money. Um, so, like I said, I think it's worth the money, but, but, but that's the reality of it for very small programs. The bigger programs, the expenses may not be proportionally as great. Uh, the other thing, it's an investment in uh, human resources. Um, we mentioned earlier that now the regional accreditations are, um, are requiring assessment as well, but it can be at some schools like ours. Only recently have we gotten the assessment people to not force us to do something to meet their needs for SACs and try to explain to them, we're already gathering that data. Don't make us repackage this for your purposes. So for example, we have to do with the SAC COC, we have to do a five-year internal review. And it seems like that schedule always works out. Like one year I'm working on the AC JMC self-study and then a year later I'm doing the other or vice versa. And I've never had it worked out where I could just simply say, see the other report. You know, it, it doesn't work that way. So uh, sometimes the faculty can be frustrated, or feel frustrated because it feels like we're duplicating efforts. Um, if you can work with your on-campus accrediting uh, people that, that can alleviate some of that. Uh, once again, I don't want that to come across as I'm saying we shouldn't be doing those things. They're worth the investment, but, but the reality is it does take a lot of resources. So that would be my two points. Okay, Michelle. Yeah, I think the 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 biggest one I heard was the seventy two credit rule, which once again is gone. But the other um, re the other reason I think some programs might not uh, be accredited is they might think their their unit is not what we're looking for. And so for you know, for example, maybe you're called journalism, and then you have all these different tracks, right? Mm -hmm. Or um, I, I don't, I mean, people call them different things, you know what I mean? Like, so, um, but one thing I would throw out there is that, you know, I've been on site teams where, you know, you get to decide what, what part of the program is accredited, right? So like, if you had, uh, an advertising PR department and, um, uh, you know, a general mass com or, you know, a, a television, um, broadcasting unit, but what you're, your television broadcasting unit um, might be split in two, you know, which Bailey is going to talk about the film. Um, you know, like we were at a at a program where the whole whole school was accredited one year, and then the next the next six years when we went back, they had done some restructuring, so the com studies people were now had a. a you know, called comm studies, right? Before they had been sort of blended in with another unit. So they were left out, right? So like that school got to say, okay, we're only accrediting journalism, public relations and broadcast. We are not accrediting the comm studies people because it gets a little muddled or complicated. Mm -hmm. I don't, and so I think sometimes people um, just assume that there's no way to be accredited unless everybody's doing the exact same thing or they're all, they can only lump everybody together within the school or the, or the department, but it really is the program itself, you know, like, okay, so the PR program might be the only program you want accredited and you might leave advertising and broadcast out. Like, I don't know why you do that, but you know, some, some unit that's up to the school to decide. And I think the other important thing is that some people might not realize that it's up to them to decide what, what they put forward six years later, um, which is also an important point. So um, Michelle, I'll just jump on that to say that these are reasons people choose to not get accredited and they are based on old information or inaccurate information, right? Old inaccurate information, number one, that 72 units of a student's 120 degree program have to be taken outside of your unit no longer accurate. And Pat, I actually just stumbled on across a part of the website that needs to be updated, so I'll send that to you. No longer accurate, 72 hour rule, gone. 
The other thing that's a holdover because we now have four generations of faculty in the workplace, right? And we all know that faculty have really long memories. So the faculty who are around perhaps at a time when you had to be unit accredited, that's gone. Accreditation now is not just about a formally organized unit. You can have a little sub program within the formally organized unit that's accredited. But, okay, but, so that's, but, these are like ancient myths. But, but, Pat, but go me, ahead, jump in. I just wanted to just chime in though. It, it is important to, to, to realize we, we don't accredit, because I do get asked questions about this all the time, two, two things, two points to make. We don't accredit majors. Um, we, if you, it, you as, as uh, Michelle was saying and, and Bei Ling, if, you, if there's a portion of your program you want accredited, that, that is fine, but you have to be able to show that that unit has autonomy. They, they have to have their own, their own budget, their own resource. I mean, it, it cannot be just, oh, we, we just want to accredit this one major. The other thing I would say in terms of the mis, mis, misinformation too, is just the other day I got, I was contacted by a school on the West Coast. They've got, they've got a new um, director who's very interested in seeking accreditation. And he had a meeting with his faculty. And he said, the first thing that they said was, um, oh, only R1 schools are accredited by ACJMC, so those, which of course is not true. And I actually had a person on my staff um, working on actually figuring out how many R1 schools are not. I mean, we, we have many R1 schools and we're very proud of them, um, but they're, most of them are not. And so just people make assumptions about things. So you just, we just, you know, we, we get asked questions like that all the time. So. So can we actually transition to audience questions, Pat, because I think sure, this question sure. about the film program is aligned with what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. what, what is the question? I, I'm so sorry. the question is that this unit is already accredited. How would oh. ACEJMC view us creating a new program in filmmaking to add to our current programs? Would that hurt or benefit our reaccreditation? And do we know if there are many ACEJMC accredited schools that also include filmmaking as a program? We we do have some, um, you know. I don't I don't have a count of how many. We we definitely have um, some programs that that include film in in what is in the accredited unit. Um, and I would say, I mean, it's it's not going to hurt or help you. It's you would just have to show us how your film, um, if it's a department or whatever, um, you know, is meeting our standards. That's that's all. That's really all. We we have we have uh, programs that add new areas to their to their unit all the time and, and some who you know drop them too so that is absolutely um absolutely fine it just it's just a matter of a, um a school that has some uh parts of it that are that are accredited and some are not it's it's because of the parts that are not they're they're not really you know they're not really following our values and competencies that are in um uh, standard two because they don't fit with what that particular section is doing. But um, absolutely, we, we have schools. I, if you want, if you want to email me offline, I can, I, we can certainly look, I mean, I can, we can pull together a list of the schools that do have that, that just, and you can contact them. Is okay, that, James, I saw your hand up for something. Yeah, you have just something quickly, um, we were at the um, council it, meeting and didn't yeah. this come up that one it of the did. council members was kind of indicating that he or she and I don't remember who brought it up that we need to maybe start paying more attention to um, these sorts of programs yeah yeah because it yeah. was they were they said they it, the film it made sense to credit film programs that spent more time talking about um, using the same standards journalists journalists would use you know or mass communicators would use rather than the narratives that um it, you know like true entertainment films might use um it, right. that, yeah. that was the discussion we had at the council meeting james because they said that there'd be a big difference there um if you're teaching them to do creative writing and that type of thing versus um you know a, a documentary type thing right. where it was more journalistic in nature right. And so I got the sense that there's some uh, a level of interest in 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 going down that road. So, okay. So, like everything else, you know, we keep evolving with the times. Another question from the audience is, um, what resources does ACEJMC provide to support the school in fostering a successful accreditation process? Um, and so I'm going to say, Pat, both as a resource and as the person who can best answer this question. <laughs> well. Uh... 
I'm not sure um, exactly what you're what you're referring to. I mean, we we um, we're I have a staff of uh, one full time person and one um, part time person. Um, we're we answer questions. I, I do Zoom meetings all the time with with schools that are interested in seeking accreditation. Schools that have questions as they come up. I mean, we're available as as a resource. We we want schools to improve. We want schools to to be accredited. Um, we we uh, we prepare uh, best practice examples. Um, we we now we now have. Uh, our council president has set up six task forces that are that are working on on various areas that'll provide more resources for schools as well. I'm not sure if that's answering your question. If there's something specific that you, you're asking with, with, that we do, you offer training at AEJMC. Um, you offer you know you offer tons of training sessions that are you know even at ASJMC you've offered some training sessions. Yeah, we we do there, workshops. There's other training sessions yeah. just like mm -hmm. this one. Um, so there's you know, there's other, there's lots of opportunity to reach out to people and ask for questions. And, and, and that reminds me when we do have, um, uh, for schools that are coming up for review in the next two years, for example, we did a, we did it virtually. Sometimes we do them in person, but we did a virtual workshop um, in May for schools that have visits coming up this year and, and next year. We, and we, um, and we we did a we trained forty new site team members last year as well. So, but again, and if there's it, something specific that you want, and you know, just let yeah. me know. And I think as a school that undergoes accreditation, it's reassuring that when we send the uh, our self study in, Pat and her staff will review that and looking for any major uh, issues before they send it on to the site team. So that's that's helpful as well. You're muted, Bailing. Okay, classic. So I also just dropped into the chat the um, URL for the ACEJMC booklet that's on the website, as well as the collection of resources that's on the website. So two related questions coming in now from the um, participants is whether accreditation applies only to journalism, but also does it apply to public relations? And the answer to that is yes, 100% it can apply to both. Now here's the kicker, um, follow up question, if it does include PR, how would a school approach an application when journalism and PR are in separate colleges within the university? That's a new one because often, well not often, sometimes they can be in separate departments, but it's under one college, one dean. So if they're in two separate colleges, Pat? Um, I'm not aware that, uh, I'm not aware of any of any accredited school that has just PR and, and not anything else. But I would say, I, I don't know of anything that would prevent it from happening. I just would need to know more about mm -hmm. that individual school. Um, we, we, we accredit many programs that include public relations. I mean, many. And in case you, uh, you all may not know, the uh, the president of the council actually is uh, he was he before he became president, he was the PRSA representative on our council. So and we have many PR practitioners and educators on the council, on the committee. Um, it's, it's very much a, a, a part of part of what we do. Um, so, so, uh, so to this particular question, I, I would say there's nothing preventing it. It's doable, but it's an unusual case. So we'll just talk to Pat and, and coordinate. Um, but 100% and there are PR programs that are accredited. And also just as we were previously talking about the um, efficient use of time, right? Where your assessment of curriculum could be used for ACEJMC, but also for your regional accreditation. A lot of programs also um, efficiently use their time to do a CEJMC accreditation for the entire mass comm program and then take that same information specific to the PR program and apply and apply for um, the, the certification of public relations education, which is done through PRSA, right? So there's multiple ways to be efficient in these processes. Okay, uh, anything else? 
So from the audience, an observation about the benefit of accreditation that they've discovered is that the site team's closing meetings with the provost and the president help tremendously in procuring resources such as new equipment investment. They're able to indicate that studio equipment is getting um, long in the tooth. This is accepted um, from people from the outside when it would not be accepted coming from the unit itself. And yes, that's true. It's a common. Uh, there's always something about those folks coming in from the outside that makes them more credible. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So any other final closing comments from the panelists to kind of send us off with your your best tip or your best encouragement for undertaking the process? I just think there's there's a lot of us who've been on site teams or on the council who are always willing to help. You know, um, so I think the most important thing is just to reach out and ask for help. Um, so then it doesn't seem so daunting because um, we're always willing to give the help. Um, you know, I I'm constantly giving help to my the school I got my undergraduate degree at. They're always asking who's also accredited. <laughs> They're always asking me to review different things, you know, just because they know I'm involved in the crediting process. And so, um, so yeah, I think that all of us are really willing and ready to help. Um, it's just a matter of you making, you know, I just don't know who, who wants help or needs it. So, yeah. And yeah. I would just echo, would echo that, that um, before I took this job, I, I served on more than more than two dozen site teams. And I, I learned something on every one of those visits and and people, um, the, the school uh, faculty and administrators would, would told us, you know, that they all learned things too. It didn't matter the size of the school or anything. You get so much out of it um, and, and people are willing to help. Uh, you know, there we get our expenses paid, but you know, we're we're not paid any kind of honorarium. And I, people, when people say they, they, it's a lot of work, but we love it. We, I mean, it's, I know it sounds crazy, but we we love it, and we 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 feel you know, it's 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 our way of of giving giving back to this this wonderful industry. And um, as you know, Bailing mentioned, she's put the link. There's so many resources. There, you know, we we're one of the most public of all of the accrediting bodies. Um, there are uh, we we we've actually been told we're the most public. We 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 don't go into a back room and the council discusses and votes on your school. It's public. Um, we have we have our our resources. Uh, we um, we have so much available on our website. So I would websites. So I would just urge everybody to spend some time with that. Thank you. So in closing, I'll just wrap this up to say that this recording will be made available later from SBJ. Um, again, this was a panel offered by the Journalism Education Committee of the Society of Professional Journalists in collaboration with the ACJMC. The next SPJ Journalism Education Committee panel on this topic will be on Tuesday, September 12th at four o'clock Eastern, one o'clock Pacific. And the topic will be lessons learned top tips as journalism schools embark on the accreditation journey. You can register in advance for this meeting and the link is in the chat. So thank you everyone for your time today and thank you so much to the panelists.